be creative, be bold, use the interweb, as you just said, and just try to put your feet to the fire with it as much as possible, because there's always space, I feel, for new voices, exciting new ideas, and new ways of orienting us to thinking a different way. And if you have an idea and you think you've got it, you should pursue it. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz, and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, yes, we are live at the 92nd Street Y with the one and only Emily Blunt, everybody. We ready for this? Um, I'm so excited for this. Is there a more versatile actor working today than Emily Blunt? Spoiler alert, no, there is not. Uh, you want comedy? Devil Wears Prada. You want action? Edge of Tomorrow. A thriller? A quiet place. A musical? Mary Poppins, people. Mary Poppins is here. <laughs> Um, and then there's drama, of course. Uh, the movie of 2023, for my money, I'm obsessed still, uh, is Oppenheimer. What a beautiful piece of work by all involved, and it is, uh, it is being celebrated justifiably so. Emily is being celebrated justifiably so. She has a Golden Globe nomination, folks, a BAFTA nomination, a Screen Actors Guild nomination, and for the first time, long overdue, an Academy Award nomination for Emily Blunt. <laughs> Please give a warm New York City welcome and 92 NY welcome to Academy Award nominee, Emily Blunt, everybody. Thank you. The best. Thank you. It's on. It's on. You are it's live. It's on. I'm live. Listen to that voice, that Academy Award nominated voice. <laughs> Um, it's good to see you, Emily. You too. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, does that, has that sunk in yet to hear Academy Award nominee? Does it no. feel natural yet? No, none of it feels natural. None of, none of this feels natural. What are you but... talking about? This is totally normal. Another <laughs> night. But I mean, I, I would imagine there's a bit of a, like, can you exhale a little bit after this long run with Oppenheimer where like, you hear the buzz, like, oh, she's gonna be nominated, the whole yeah. thing, and you don't wanna jinx it, you don't wanna talk about it, but at least now we can kind of like, it happens. I mean, it's all quite scary, you know, the anticipation of it, and I think you just try not to listen to buzz, because buzz can be built on sand sometimes, and right. so when it did happen, and when it happened in such a far-reaching way for all of us in the movie and every crew member, it was magical, it was the best. I did have a brief cry in the middle of Brooklyn. Just a brief, <laughs> brief weep directly after picking up my dog's poop. But, right. um, Unrelated to the perfect. dog poop. It, yeah. was, it was connected or not? <laughs> I did pick up her poop and then I heard that I got nominated. So it was right. perfect. Keeping it real. <laughs> who, who in your life, besides yourself, obviously taking that satisfaction, who did it touch the most for you to be recognized? John had a really good cry as well. Yeah. Yeah. After helping me with the poop. So. Right. Teamwork, that's a lot I, of poop. I think he went and put it in the trash and then we both cried. Right. The secret word tonight, it's poop. <laughs> it's <you> poop. <laughs> um, that being said, are your kids rooting for you or Ryan Gosling more to win? Ryan Gosling. Yeah. I mean, he's like reigns supreme in our house. I had to go last week and do a, a bit of press for Fall Guy, a bit of early press. And it was a, it was a trip that we hadn't planned. So I said to the girls, like, you know who's to blame for this? And they were like, who? And I was like, Ken. <laughs> and my kids were like, really? And so they started singing, I blame Ken. <laughs> and then my little one, who's particularly in love with him, was like, I mean, I don't really want to blame Ken because I love him so much. And Aww. I was like, yeah, it was very cute. Have they, have they met Ryan by now? I mean, they haven't, but they... They, feel like they want to right. bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good reward for good behavior. Yeah, exactly. You get to meet Ken. Yeah, at some point. At some point. Um, look, this, this movie, I, you know I, I'm obsessed with this movie, as, as many, many people are. Um, it is lightning in a bottle for a movie to come together yeah. like this, as you well know. Um, the Oppen homies yeah. are the, have you guys heard this, the, about the Oppen homies? This is a real thing. It, it is such a real thing. Like, Robert, I feel, is very much the instigator of keeping the Oppen homies alive. He always likes to FaceTime me first thing in the morning and I usually have a face mask on. And, <laughs> and I could see this morning he was trying to get me and Killian and Killian wisely ignored his FaceTime request, but I took it. Right. 
just to show him my face mask, which he rejoiced in. But I'm sure. It's, it's the best tribe. I love those dudes so much. What caused that kind of bonding? Because, you know, we always talk about, oh, we bonded, we bonded. You guys really bonded. This we happened. We did, yeah. We're, we're really a family. Have we, I got some open homies in here tonight? I know I do. There are actual... I know Oli and Devon are here. Are you guys here? Hi. Yeah! <laughs> Two of the I... open homies in the house. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, the environment we, on set, what happened? I think because we were, we all started it in the middle of the New Mexican desert and we were all staying in this hotel together and that bonds people. You, do, you, you get really close, you get to know each other. You're not going home to your family or your, or your other life. You are only living in this alternate reality and we just sit and have quesadillas every night. It's just <laughs> amazing. I mean, it sounds like living the dream, working we, with we the best filmmaker the on the planet, yeah. eating quesadillas with the best actors on the planet. Yeah, but we, we, we didn't really see Chris or Killian. They were sort of Right. It seems like Killian cabins. had a bit of a different experience than the rest of you. It was a heavier weight. I mean, the right. rest of us could just jetpack in and out, but he was in every frame. So. Before we get to the actual like substance of what you did, like the what's what's come in the wake of Oppenheimer is sort of so surprising because no one people you know Chris Nolan films they do well they're celebrated sure but a film of this type is not expected to be a near billion dollar grossing movie no. to inspire young people to dress as Oppenheimer going yeah. to the theater yeah that happened yeah <laughs> um so this must have been just a series of bizarre wonderful surprises yes in the last and few surprises months. are the best way to bring a movie out you know if you're counting your chickens before the movies come out i think you can all often be in trouble and i don't know if any of us expected it to have this meteoric response it yeah. was so jarring and startling and exciting and rewarding, ultimately, that you've made something challenging, provocative, rare, and it's three hours long, and people wanna go, and they wanna go again and again. And I have friends who've seen it five times, and five times. this dog, yeah. five times. <laughs> <laughs> All in IMAX, 70 mil, gotta go, so cool. the whole thing. Um, I'm curious, like, the, okay, so t t take, take me back to getting this role because Chris Nolan, is all his projects are shrouded in secrecy. As I understand it, he, he knows kind of the actors he wants. He yeah. invites you into the club and says, what? Read the script and you're in? Like, what happens? He meets everyone, so you get the call. I mean, not that he has a phone. Right. But you get a call <laughs> from someone, you know. Right. And they say Chris would like to meet you, and at which point I like ran to meet him. I was so thrilled. And I sat and chatted with him, and he's wonderfully humble and understated and <laughs> sort of almost nonchalant about it. You know, he has this massive, iconic, ridiculous film that he's about to make. And yet he's like, right, so do you want to read it? And, you know, is the role of... Kitty Oppenheimer, and if you're interested, love you to do it. And it's just, it, that's it. That's, Whole that's the ceremony. Yeah. And then you read this utterly astonishing script that was so visceral and so exhilarating to read. It was so perfect. And then he, come, he kind of saunters in, he goes, do you enjoy it? You know, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> like exhausted by it and so thrilled by it. And I sort of gibbered at him incoherently about how much I loved it. And he goes, great, yeah, should be good then. It's done. <laughs> you know? End of negotiations. <laughs> End of negotiations. <laughs> but like, is there, is there pressure in that moment? Because as I understand it, you're literally reading it like in his study. I read it in his library, which is already overwhelming because there's just, there's far too many books in there. He's read far too many right. books. So you all, we get already it, you're you feel, smart man. We, you just feel stupid. <laughs> you're like, I should read more books. But like, does he leave you alone? It's a long script, it's a dense script. Yeah. Does he leave you alone and say, you've got two and a half hours, here's this bell? Like, no. what, like what happens? <laughs> I want the actual nitty gritty. No, he just says, when you're done, let me know. So I texted Emma, his wife, and I was like, I'm, I'm done. And then are you putting the pressure on yourself like Well, I also didn't know what say? to text, so I went, holy shit, I'm done. You know, I didn't know like... She might have thought you ruined something in the study, like you yes. spilled something. Like, you know. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, so then he came in and it was, it, I think the script was so wonderful that you had so much to talk about. Right. And you know. look, I often talk to actors about like, you know, in approaching a role, it's more beneficial generally to look for the connections rather than the differences. There are obviously many massive differences between you and Kitty. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love her, but. No, well, that, well, so like, what did you connect with? Where is the point of intersection that you found that you could relate to? I mean, my feeling is I really tried to connect with their experience on every level. Like you tried to connect with the whole weather system of the person and they can be stormy and ugly and horrible and dreary, but if you can connect to I guess the shadow of why they're like that. I'm, I love people, I love all their weird idiosyncrasies and their grievances and I think there was so much about her that I empathize with, that, that idea of that extraordinary brain wasted, you know, and decaying at the ironing board and the anger and the simmering rage that would follow, you know, she's the a frustration. Woman born in the wrong time for who she was, for what she wanted to be. And she kind of raged against the machine as best she could. Right. But there's only so much I think she could do. And then she married this, this icon and clearly worshipped him, loved him, supported him, was there. A hugely stabilizing force in his life. And yet she was so unstable. Yeah. Um, I think bled for him, but I think to her own detriment. And I guess I just empathized with that, understood it, and I've seen a lot of women feel frustrated with their lot in life. That idea of being um, defined by being someone's mummy or someone's wife, and it's okay for that not to be enough for you, you know? And we need those women who don't wanna fit into some convenient mold. Yeah. And she ultimately, I think, was a hugely influential presence in his life. It's fair to say, I feel like Kitty's blood alcohol level throughout this film is always <laughs> slightly above the yeah. legal limit. Like she wouldn't pass the, the walk test. No. I assume you're not the actor. Have you ever in your career ever thought- Been wasted? Yeah, have you ever drunk? What's in there? Have you ever? <laughs> What's in there? No, but like some actors, you know, drink to play drunk. I, you can't. Right? No, What's I've saying? done, I've done it once and it was a disaster. <laughs> I was so paranoid and messy that I was like, this is a, it was way, don't worry, way, way back in the day. Right. I'm not even gonna tell you what it was for. Yeah, I can tell, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, I know which one. Um, no, I prefer to be stone cold sober. Right. And I just, I mean, I seem to have done this a couple of times. I like think girl on the train. I'm like the yep. go-to. Yeah, get us. Uh, <laughs> ugly drunks. No judgments. <laughs> oh, okay. it's, it's a fascinating character, like, because a lot of it, like, they're, and we're gonna, we're gonna show a, a, an amazing scene towards the end of the film in a moment, but there's a lot of, like, sitting in silence, too. Yeah. Like, do you, like, coming on set for a day when you don't have dialogue, is that in some ways as challenging, as intriguing as a day chock full of dialogue? No, I mean, I like all of it. And for me, it's the silent moments are just as fascinating. I'm just as interested in performing those as I am a sort of quick bantered scene. Um, I mean, I'd make a joke to Chris and be like, am I even in focus? Like, am I just sort of a blurry, <laughs> Like <laughs> behind Killian for the first half of the movie, um, but I I like all of it. Have you ever gotten lost watching an actor's performance, being like, "Holy shit, that's Meryl Streep delivering constantly, the performance!" Constantly, right? yeah. Constantly, constantly gripped. Forget my line. Just pulled, <laughs> magnetized by it. Yeah, right. Killian d will do that. Yeah. When you saw the finished film, as I understand it, the experience of seeing it, you saw it with Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're seeing that finished product, which like, it feels like one thing on set, it feels great. You're talking about those moments on set, but then, you know, the score, the editing, I mean, this is like, Chris brings it all together. What do you remember about sitting next to Robert watching this? It's really difficult to word because it was really overwhelming, I think, for all of us, because you're right, you have this um, interior experience on set where you're looking out and you're seeing everything from the inside out. And then you see the whole thing and you feel completely 
ambushed and lacerated by the experience of watching it. It's so devastating and so stunning. I felt like my bones were gonna break watching it. I felt like this weight on my chest watching it. It was the most physical experience I've had watching any movie. It's usually weird to watch yourself in a movie the first time, I, I feel, because I'm sort of you know, looking and going, oh, <laughs> you know, I did it like that. Like, oh, I could have done better on that. And I, why don't you do it like this? You know, but then watching that film, I, I felt like I was simultaneous out, simultaneously outside of it, like I wasn't in it. And yet the film was like it reached through the screen and grabbed me and pulled me right inside of it. It was just so wild. Couldn't even walk after it. So staggered towards Chris, trying to tell him how much I loved it. Do you? Do you think you connected with Kitty because both you and Kitty have experienced being married to obsessive geniuses that, that, <laughs> that have created scary John things? John Krasinski's Oppenheimer? <laughs> the Oppenheimer of the 2000s. Exactly. Watch, um, watch this space, see what he makes. Yeah. There's the whole quote. <laughs> exactly. Have you guys started to use bring in the sheets as a euphemism for anything? I know, and wife? by the way, what a reductive thing to say to his wife, bring in the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> when this thing is unleashed on the world. Um, no, we have not used bringing the sheets. I think he'd... It's kind of the high Barbie. I'd be like, you bring them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two categories in life for me. There's the stuff you want to make compromises on and the stuff you never want to make compromises on. Okay, category A. Maybe you go see the movie you're not so into because your loved one wants to see it. Maybe you go to the grocery store that's close to you, but it's not so great. And then there's category B, the stuff you never want to compromise on. And that, of course, is all about your health. No compromises, guys. That's why ZocDoc is so important. This is the app for you, the place where you can find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable listen to you, and yes, prioritize your health. You can search by location, availability, and insurance, so there's literally no compromises here. With ZocDoc, you've got more options than you know. ZocDoc is a free app, yes, it's a free app, and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. If I need a doctor, ZocDoc is there for me. Go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad download the zocdoc app for a free then find and book a top rated doctor today all of these doctors have verified reviews from actual real life patients this is the service for you remember that's zocdoc.com slash happy sad zocdoc.com slash happy sad Okay, so let's circle back a little bit. So I, I, I know we, we've talked before about your background and your parents and your mom who had interest in acting. Yes. How much of, I, I can't imagine like the success you've experienced, what that's been like to experience through your parents, through your mom, who, who, who was an actor, who yeah. wanted a career, and for various reasons it just didn't pan out in the way she imagined yeah. it would. I mean, I think it's partly why I entered into the business without a rose-tinted view of it, because I'd seen it be harsh you know, to someone I someone I love. And she was so brilliant and then just had too many kids and a busy husband, different time. Yeah. Feeling bad, juggling it. God forbid you want a career and, uh, and have four children. But I think she has done an amazing job of separating her own sadness and not being able to fulfill it and her pride of me and I think she's so relieved it worked out. I think she was nervous about me going into it. I'm the only kid in my family that didn't go to university or college. And I said to her, I'm just going to give it a go for a year. And then, thank God, it happened. But I don't know what it's like for them. I think I've always made them aware that there will be so many, uh, so many opinions and so many people with thoughts about me and it doesn't matter if people think are saying lovely things and for me the opinions that matter are theirs and the rest of it as much as it's lovely it bleeds into white noise and the people you rely on are the people who know you best and those are the most meaningful 
Does she, have, does she have a favorite performance of yours? A, I mean, she loves this one. Yeah, well. She likes, um, she likes some of the like random ones. It's almost like she's trying to be contrary. Yeah. Like even the ones that got bad reviews, she's like, I really like Jane Austen book club. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I thought you were very good yeah. at that. Big Gulliver's Travels fan. Huge, Huge. Gulliver's fans. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to bring that one up. You you. Have I apologize. To. It's, such it's contractual. A sore point. It's like a thorn. <laughs> well, I was going to bring up like, do you learn as much from like we never end up in these kind of things talking about things like like that or the Wolfman or things that like like have the best of I love intentions. The Wolfman, so. <laughs> but I mean, like they have the best of intentions. They have they great do. cast. All of them do. Do you take something away from the ones that just for whatever reason don't click? Yeah, because sometimes you've had a, an awesome time on them and you've made friends and you've had a lasting experience, whether or not it lasts with audiences is a bit yeah. out of your control. You know, every movie is a bit of a leap into the unknown. Yeah. So I don't, I don't presuppose that people are going to love a movie ever. You don't really know. As long as I love it, it's the reason why I want to do it. I mean, I think 99% of the folks probably in this room first saw you in Devil Wears Prada, mm -hmm. of course. And I think what was so startling, yeah. <laughs> Devil. Was, look, we had seen Anne Hathaway, who we knew was great, and Meryl, and Stanley Tucci, and so like, all those ingredients were familiar. And then it was like this fully formed, like, amazing actor who had this insane comic timing working with those folks. Mm. Like, do you remember like, it, it, it's such a confident performance, because it has to be. Were you confident? Did you have nerves on the set of that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the table read was hell. It was Meryl Streep was there, it was just, right. I was 22, I mean, it was really scary. And um, I just remember that sweaty, palmed feeling of turning the pages and knowing my first line was coming up, you know. <gasps> and <laughs> I don't think Meryl had even entered the movie at that point, so I, I was just terrified. And then I remember I said my first line, which I think was, human resources certainly have an odd sense of humor. And I remember, <laughs> poor Annie, and I remember Meryl going, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so grateful. It was just this little chortle she gave, and it was just very reassuring. You shot that here in New York. Shot it here, yeah. You are a New Yorker. Any yeah. connection between just that happy experience and making your life here in the city? I mean, I have to say, it, it was my first venture into New York was shooting that movie, and Annie was amazing to me, and I didn't know anything about New York, and she sort of took me under her wing and showed me around, and, and now I live, I mean, I live in in Brooklyn, but. <laughs> How you have to say it. Brooklyn. Um, You're a Blimpies? Are you close to any Blimpies? I've never been to a Blimpies. Yeah, Blimpies is, I mean, Subway is replaced. It's like Subway, but okay. Blimpies isn't really in anymore. That's I love the one a Subway, dated, though. That's the one dated reference, I think. I love the BLT at Subway. Yeah, they got Classic. quality work. What bread do you go for? Do you go for like the wheat, the? No, the, the white one. The white one, okay. Yeah. I don't know why I'm like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Move on. <laughs> In this age where everything is sequelized, how close has it come? Have you ever read a script? Has there ever felt like oh, real momentum? Never. It's surprising, isn't it? I think so, but sometimes things should be cherished and preserved in this bubble, and it's okay, and, you know, I'm, yeah. we're all good with it. Yeah. And I think, didn't Meryl say something funny about it? They asked her about it when they said, <laughs> would you want to do a sequel? She went... Yeah, if I don't have to lose the, the weight. But I think she said the effing weight or something. <laughs> Amazing. How, how challenging is it to pretend every time somebody says their stomach flew away from their goal weight to pretend like it's the first time you've heard it? I, it happens at least twice a week, so I, I'm always like, oh, yeah. That's a good actor. Yeah, that's a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, it struck me, going back through the filmography, you have done so much physical like hardcore action in your yeah. in your career. Like you put your buddy The Rock to shame, let's be real. Yeah. Come on. I leave him in the dust, <laughs> kick it over him. How, how did that happen? I what, don't what, know. What was, the, was it Sicario? Was that the first kind of like physical, physically demanding role maybe? Yeah, was it? I think it was Sicario and Edge of Tomorrow were pretty close to each other. Yeah, I, I did Edge of Tomorrow first. Did you? Okay. Well, for, I, uh, let, me, let me bring up... Looper, start. maybe. Was, Looper, got the shotgun. But then I'm only got, the I've only got the yeah. shotgun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not really right. physical. Right, No, I was very surprised when... I mean, I was thrilled, because I, I was kind of a sporty kid, but I didn't... Um, 
you know, you don't know what you're capable of doing. I feel Edge of Tomorrow was the deep end of action. Okay, so well, I want to get to Edge of Tomorrow in a second, but I do want to bring up Sicario, because okay. I, I am obsessed with that film. I watched it again this past week, just a good excuse to go back to it. <laughs> uh, the great Denis Villeneuve. Yes. I mean, you, Brolin, Benicio, all amazing in it. And the supporting cast, they got Bernthal, Kaluuya. The it, best. It's so good. The best. And I, I, thought, I remember Brolin told me once, like, he didn't even realize how good that movie was going to be yeah. at the time. Yeah. Like, we were talking before about kind of like expectations and not knowing, like you, you always hope for the best. Like, were you surprised at how good that movie turned out or did you have a sense of what Denis was I feel was I had a sense of it. Um, I think Denis has this wonderfully warm, inviting quality to him that he sort of, I feel it's all, a, it's all like a ruse. Like, he makes you feel like he doesn't know what he's doing. And right. He's like, Madame, I haven't had enough coffee. I need a side. I don't know. I don't know about this scene. What do you, what do you think? What do you think? And he knows. Yeah. No, he, it's all up there. It's all, yeah. it's all perfect. And just to see the great Roger Deakins work, I, it was like being in church. I was just like, oh, it was extraordinary. I know that there were sequences like the border crossing, I thought was unbelievable yes. when we shot it. And like the scene at the end with Benicio was like, that wasn't really written. We kind of made it up on the day. It was those wonderful, spontaneous moments that you know you've made something special. You just don't know how it will fit into the rest of the film. But I just thought the whole thing was so sinister, exciting, provocative, and spare, like the spareness of yeah. it. The dread that just hangs in the oh, air of that film. that like overwhelming dread all the way through. Yeah, go and back. you worry about her, you worry about her and her in this amoral world. You've got this moral person in the middle of a amoral world and it was just, I just was so proud yeah. when I saw it. Yeah, go back and take a look at the scene, like the scene with you and Bernthal, that's like a love scene that turns into this. Nasty. Nast, bit of nastiness is just remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable staging, everything about it is yeah. just fantastic. And the fight we had, we didn't over plan it, you know, so it was a really ugly fight, yeah. you know. And it feels, it feels like. It feels so real. And Bernthal used to be a boxer, so he was like, my face is mush, I don't feel it, you can hit me, I won't feel it. And I was like, I will. Amazing. You know? <laughs> so there's been, there's been some buzz around that there might be finally a Sicario 3. Do you, have you, is this real? Is this I mean, could, I, I hear rumblings, but there's nothing, there's nothing firm. Okay, because you know? Denis denied. Denis said he's well, not. Well, because I haven't seen anything. Like, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's hearsay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. The other thing I'm contractually bound always to bring up with you, because it's such <laughs> a great piece of work. Um, I mean, the only thing better than, like, you know, heroic Tom Cruise is cowardly Tom Cruise. Cowardly lion Tom Cruise is the best. So good. He's the best, cow he's the best scared actor in the world. Right. He's so good. Um, and you have to be the badass in that one. Like go, I mean, you were just saying, so that's basically, that's kind of your leap into the unknown. Yes. And you have to sell it right from the get-go. Every yeah. moment she's on screen, yeah. she is this iconic action hero. Did that feel, again, like what was, was it mostly about physical prep on that? Just confidence? What was the? I mean, the physical prep was a huge, hugely transformational part of it because I think up until that point, I thought I'd worked out. And <laughs> then you get a trainer and you're like, I have not, you know. <laughs> like, I've never worked out in my life. Right. So it was three months of six days a week, two workouts a day. It was, I couldn't even move the first two weeks. I remember brushing my teeth like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was in so much pain and I'd get up in the morning and just even like sitting down, you'd be like, oh my God, like <laughs> it was, you're just in constant pain. All my muscles were just, just torn and ruined. And, and then you start to shape shift and it's so exciting. And that lethal quality to the character could only really come when I looked at myself differently in the mirror. And she's stripped of all femininity, any curviness, anything feminine. She's just so... She's like a killing machine. She's a killing kind of, machine. Yeah. You know, and there's, and she's lost her humanity and right. she should look that way. And um, so it was exciting to go through it. It was not for the faint of heart. And I think 
we all loved making it so much. It was such a kinetic, exciting experience working with Doug Lyman, who's so off his rocker in the best way yeah. and uh, such a brilliant filmmaker. And, and Tom in that role, yeah. you know, where he's not, that there's nothing heroic about that part. And yet actually he becomes so heroic because of his right. vulnerability in it. And right. we loved it. We were shells of our former selves by the end of it, but it was awesome. That's another one that's been talked about for years as, again, we've yes. talked about this forever, about a potential I think that's sequel. a more real conversation. Right. Well, so the, You're so like, well, no, I know. I mean, so there was a script, yes. but that was a long time ago, and it sounds like yes. that was going to pick up immediately, and now it's been like a decade. We need yes. to be... I think when we were first talking about the sequel, it was right before I was about to do Mary Poppins, so it was quite a while ago. Right. And then I, I think if we're going to do one, we would have to reimagine what the sequel would right. look like, you know? And now, now Tom's in business with Warner Brothers. It feels like there's more. It feels like it could be good. I don't know. What's the business of Warner Brothers? He signed some kind of like deal where he's going to be making a lot of gotcha. money. Gotcha. I, I, lo I love biz talk. You know, yeah. you know me in biz talk. What's his deal look like? <laughs> <laughs> What's the back end? Yeah. What's the back end? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um, Mary Poppins, I think, there. So you've done two musicals. I mean, talk about musicals that take, take on. Sondheim and Mary frickin' Poppins. Mary frickin' Poppins. <laughs> As the kids say. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know how you round out that trio. Like, are you, do you, do you quit while you're ahead? Like, what do you? Probably, I mean, unless no. Rob Marshall wants to do another one. I would really only do one with Rob. You know, he's my dearest friend and he's the greatest partner, so. We've talked about it. Yeah. We just don't know which one or what, or if it's a musical or if it's something else, you know? And you, you told me the last time we chatted that the only impediment to potentially doing whether musical or, or play on stage is it's a very valid reason. It's, it's family life, right, yeah. basically? Yeah, I think for me, the girls are still so little and bedtime so important. I mean, the negotiation tonight to even come and speak to you is a thing. So if it's a four month, five month, six month run, yeah. I just can't do it yet. Maybe when they're more disinterested in me, you know. <laughs> just put up a photo of Ryan Gosling. And just like <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Who do, who's better at the bedtime stories, the voices, you or John? Are you... We're both pretty good at the voices. I would, I would say, say, I would guess. I mean, I don't way. want to be competitive, but. I mean, his are fantastic, but we're into a Harry Potter kick right now and my Snape is not bad. I'm not going to do it. Oh, you can't. No, it's going to be so bad. It's going to be offensive to Alan Rickman. We can't. <laughs> can't. Can't. But just set the scene for me. You are doing, you're going to all the Harry Potter voices. Yeah, Pretend I do. I'm your child. I mean, John, John does Pretend a great um, Hagrid. <laughs> 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 My little one does a really good Dumbledore. Oh. She does the whole thing. <laughs> it's, like, it's so great. Do you want, I can do Dobby if you need to invite me oh, over. Dobby's the best. Dobby's good. We call our dog Dobby because she looks like him. Oh. That's lovely. Um, that's lovely. That's lovely. Uh, Jen. That'll be cut. Move on. <laughs> wow. We're, we're too friendly. Uh, yeah. Jen Caden wants to know, would you ever consider making your own album? Jen. <laughs> Come on. Why not? No, I don't want to do that. We're not forcing you. We're not like, don't Jen, worry. I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Standards. No, the no best. way. No, 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 no. No. No, I can't. Are you a karaoke person? Do you sing for I fun? I love a bit of karaoke. What's the go-to karaoke song? Don't mind a bit of Try a Little Tenderness. <laughs> Don't mind a bit of Bobby McGee. Oh. Guys, hey, no, no more for, come on, Janis Joplin. Come on, guys. That run at the end, cry it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 2018, you violate the cardinal sin of any married couple in Hollywood. And we work together. You work together. Not once, but twice. You, you're tempting fate. What are you guys no. doing? I know, I don't know. I don't know how we survived it. Well, I mean, what that, uh, an experience like that does is it takes down all the boundaries, right? Yes. Which is yes. a scary thing. Like you can't like decompress and you, you kind of come home and it's still about a quiet place. I feel we did decompress though. I feel like, I think we share so much. We have our secret language when it comes to work. We tell each other everything. So, yes, doing a movie together was like having a wild horse in the house. It's like having a slightly dysfunctional family member that won't leave. 
and you're always talking about them, and they're just like, this fucking guy. <laughs> so sometimes after a hard day, you know, you, it, it's hard to leave it behind, but I'm a fan, you know. I think we're fans. We're fans of what each other do, and maybe that helps, and... I'd never seen him at work, and so maybe that's part of it. You're a different person at work, and it's you have to kind of acclimatize to that. Well, it's also one. scary because it's like, a, yeah, do I speak the same work language as you? Well, you don't know right. going into it. And then I quickly realized, you know, it's the great gift that John is an actor, so he knows how to speak to actors, and he's so available, and he knows how to direct actors, and... Um, is curious, and maybe that's the thing I look for most in a director, is their curiosity about what you might do, and your curiosity, and their curiosity to see you extend beyond some presupposed idea they might have had. And he has all of that, and I didn't realize how visually brilliant he was. I don't think he did. I mean, before we started, I was like, do you know what a lens is? Because I don't. I'm right. just saying. <laughs> One of us better in a better Yeah, because I have no yeah. idea what a 50 is versus 100, you know? <laughs> and he was like, I think I know. And he did. He did, definitely. Uh, and he's got a new film coming out pretty yes. soon. Yes, it's so beautiful. It's very sweet. It's more than sweet. Okay. I'm like sweet, sweet's what your mom says about something you've done, you know. Mom's in the audience. Barbara, how are we gonna, how are we doing? Barbara, Barbara's here. Barbara Horowitz. Is yeah, yeah, she's here. Guys, big cheer for Barbara. Come on. Shy. <laughs> <Thank you. Thanks. laughs> um, this episode of Happy, Sad, Confused is brought to you by BetterHelp. Well, the new year has come and gone, and it's a time of year when. We all make those resolutions, and I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to remake their life and go extreme and really just like change everything all at once, when the truth is you're succeeding, you've found ways to better your life. And with something like therapy and something like BetterHelp, you can find those strengths and build upon them. Instead of just wholesale changing your life, build upon what's working and ditch those extreme resolutions and make practical changes that actually stick. If you're like me, you've benefited from therapy. It has helped so many people I know, and it can help you. If you're thinking of starting therapy, I encourage you to give BetterHelp a try. Guys, it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. They make it that simple. Celebrate the progress you've already made, guys. Visit betterhelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash HSC. Give BetterHelp a try today. I open this by saying, and I truly mean this, like the breadth of your career is remarkable. And like the proof's in the pudding, like all the clips we've seen going from Oppenheimer to, uh, I just want to tease the audience, uh, Emily's got this amazing new movie coming in a, just a couple months that couldn't be more different in the best possible way. It's called The Fall Guy. Yes. It's you and Ryan Gosling, name check again. <laughs> uh, that is just pure delight. I'm so happy you loved it because I love it so much. It's like a joy bomb. Yeah. It's so, just awesome. So what, what, the experience of making that in brief, this is a big action comedy. It's, yes. it's kind of like a tribute to stuntmen in many ways. It is. It's such a love letter to them. And it's, it's a real throwback to those action romances that we grew up loving. And a complete love letter to making movies, but to the stuntmen who risk life and limb for us actors constantly and do it willingly and bravely, and they live for this, to be able to live out practical stunts, real old school shot practical stunts, so there's barely a stitch of CGI in our movie, and CGI is great, but it's used so limitlessly nowadays, and maybe it does distance us, because we know it's not real, but all the stunts in this from insane car rolls to car jumps to God knows what else. I mean, it's all real. And 
wildly intense watching all of it happen in real time. And then the other side is just the fun repartee between you and oh, Brian. You've so got, you've it's got just, all... he's heaven. And yep. he's so talented and frighteningly smart and so funny. I mean, just the, the most quick-witted, agile actor in the world and just a sheer delight to work with. In, in some ways, look, now at this stage of your career, you have the luxury of choice and opportunity, and these amazing filmmakers want to work with you. Like, in some ways, like early on in a career, it's kind of easy. You take whatever comes to you. Sure. Do you feel that at this point in your life, like it's, it's, it's making those choices is harder than ever, or do you feel the luxury of like, oh, I actually have some great options? I feel I've always taken choices quite seriously and thought about it, you know, at times too profoundly, probably, and... I think now, because of the kids, I'm sort of specific about when I go to work, so maybe it's just more selective about what it is and when. But I think I've always cared deeply about the choices, yeah. always. Uh, we have some audience questions. Oh, good. Yeah, finally, the good About the my good new stuff. album. <laughs> <laughs> what genre of music will it be? Um, I think this says Jean-Luc. Uh, I hope I'm saying that correctly. What type of character would you like to play in your next Nolan movie? I like that we're secreting into the universe. You're obviously going to work with Nolan again. I hope. I mean, who knows? <laughs> I hope he calls me. What kind of, let's, let's make it happen. What kind of uh, part do you want? I don't know. I mean, I feel like whatever I invent in my head, he's going to surpass with some mind-bending, extraordinary idea. So right. just, I hope he calls. That's all. We'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Now, did you or did you not ever meet with him for any of the Batman films? I met him very briefly, okay. but I don't think I was right. Well, it's okay. It worked out forever. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive and forget. Exactly. Except don't forget, apparently. <laughs> was, it, was it for Catwoman? Was it, do you remember? No. I think it was before that. I think it was according to the interweb, which is never wrong. It yeah. might have also, it might have been Maggie in I think Dark it was, Knight. It was, it was Maggie or, or Katie Holmes. Katie's Katie, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just setting the record Listen, straight. The best girl wins, all right? Always. It's all right. You beat okay. out all those others for Kitty. You just like, <laughs> locked the door and you said, this part is mine. Nothing says raging drunk like Emily Blunt, okay? <laughs> and Chris knows that. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the CV, at the bottom of the exactly. CV. Um, Stevie wants to know, is there any advice that you could give to young, new actors? Yes. Anything else, Stevie? Uh, specifically regarding how to cope with the business when oh. starting out. Okay. Put your helmet on, because it's hard. And it's okay that it's hard. And if you love it, you have access to so many different ways of putting yourself out there. You don't have to go through the traditional route. Be creative, be bold, use the interweb, as you just said, and just try to put your feet to the fire with it as much as possible. Because there's always space, I feel, for new voices, exciting new ideas, and new ways of orienting us to thinking a different way. And if you have an idea and you think you've got it, you should pursue it. It's an extraordinary business. It's not always easy. It has pitfalls. You have to live in the trenches sometimes. It can sometimes not be fun, but it can be euphoric, and I understand why people are intoxicated by it, and there's a magnet towards wanting to do it, because it's amazing, and if you think you have it, then go for it. I love it, Stevie. perfect. You earned that sip of water, that was good. Stevie. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Kate J would like to know, what is your process as an actor approaching dialects? And what was the most challenging aspect of nailing Kitty's hmm. voice? So I have a wonderful dialect coach called Liz Himmelstein. And every time I do an American accent, I love to work with Liz. And she's awesome. I've worked with her since, oh my God, since the Jane Austen book club, probably. <laughs> Um, it's two more references than I thought to the Austin Book Club <laughs> one night. <laughs> you got to give it some love. Yeah. Um, I love an accent. I love a specific dialect. And I think I had an instinct with Kitty that she should speak at a sort of velocity that was exciting and intimidating. 
I think there was something performative about her. There was something about her, from everything I read, just someone said about her, they said Kitty didn't do big talk. She, sorry, Kitty didn't do small talk, she only did big talk. And it was such a great way in to understanding her and how she wanted to be perceived. She couldn't have cared less about what people thought of her, and she could be mean as a snake. But she was so exciting and verbose. So there were clues in the script, clues in the book. And then Liz and I listened to a lot of cool broads from the 40s. <laughs> And especially someone maybe who started out as an ingenue and then got older and what happens to the voice and where does she go? And we found one person particularly that I really became fixated on and, and she was a big inspiration for Kitty, you know. You said she didn't, you think she didn't care what people thought about her. Do you mm -hmm. care enough, too little, too much? about Me? What, Yeah, what people think of you. Um, I mean, I really, uh, such a hard question, because I care about certain people. I care what certain people think of me. But I feel so much of it is out of my control. So most yeah. of it you have to kind of let slip through your fingers, you know, the, the opinions that people might form. It, that can also become like white noise, even if it's sort of negative or right. positive. It can all sort of become in the background. I, I really don't do social media, which probably helps, that I'm sort of blissfully unaware of the love or loathe, you know? So, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you but don't it's a scary know. place like, out there, yeah. Yeah, it can be yeah. a slippery slope, yeah. right? And there could be one thing that would s stick in your mind. Right. Um, but of course I care what people I care about think, sure. you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Shantanu uh, wants to know, were you a history buff prior to Oppenheimer? No, Shantanu. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I... No era of history you were pretty... No, okay. Oh. No, I mean, I read the Oppenheimer, the American Prometheus tome Big book. Big that book. we had to all read, and yeah. that, was, that was pretty extensive, but... Yeah. I mean, I couldn't rattle it off to you, but... I wasn't asking. Shantanu's <laughs> <I mean, laughs> like, say it. <laughs> uh, LB wants to know, you span so many genres as an actor, would you ever want to direct? <gasps> Maybe one day. I don't know quite yet if I want to, but I'm becoming increasingly interested and yeah, maybe one day. Um, Sue would like you to tell us about the American Institute of Stuttering. My sister, this is Sue's sister, Jenny is a speech pathologist, and today is her birthday. Happy birthday, birthday Jenny. Woo. So this is obviously something very important to you that connects yes. to your, your childhood and to your life. Tell us a little bit about So I was a stutterer as a kid from the age of five to 16, probably. And once you're a stutterer, I guess you're always a stutterer. And so certain environments, I, I notice when I'm really, really tired or super stressed about something, I will struggle with my speech, especially on the phone. And if someone's like, well, what happened? Tell me, I'll have a problem saying it under pressure. Um, it is something I've learned about so much more now I didn't have the knowledge as a kid, so I did often feel weird and completely humiliated by it and embarrassed of it and would try to mask it. And usually if you mask it, you just go inward and you stop talking. And I've learned since through American Institute of Stuttering and all the incredible emboldening work they do to get people to sort of wrap their arms around this disability, this part of themselves, that it's neurological, it's biological, it's nearly often hereditary, and the most important thing is it's not your fault. There's nothing you can do. It's a synaptic brain thing that you have a predisposition for, and it runs really prominently in my family. So um, my uncle, my cousin, my grandfather all stutter, and so it was just something I accepted. I felt like I grew out of it to a certain extent, Acting was certainly helpful. I've learned as well, a lot of people use performing as a way to free their voices. 
And maybe there's something ethereal about it. Maybe there's something emotional about freeing up your voice from this disability that in everyday life, when I'm just talking to someone, when all of us are talking to someone, you'll use A, B, C, D, E part of your brain. But apparently when you're being creative and you're transforming into something else, you're using a whole different part of yourself. And for whatever reason, it stops the record skipping and you can speak more freely. And I still don't really understand it. And even all the experts at AIS are intrigued and they want to know more about it because, but all the guys I've dragged to American Institute of Stuttering from Samuel L. Jackson to the great Bruce Willis and Harvey Keitel and Ed Shearer and all these amazing talents, they all are stutterers or were very prominent stutterers. And I don't think they understand why when they act, they don't, you know? I can't imagine like, for a young stutterer out there to hear you speak about this must just mean the world. Well, I love talking to yeah. the young stutterers yeah. for sure, because then you have an idea of hope or promise yeah. that it doesn't really define you, you know? All right, we're gonna end with the Happy Second Fuse profoundly random questionnaire. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, God. Uh, do you prefer a first day of a shoot or the last day of the shoot? Last day? Yeah. I feel the first day I'm like outside of myself. I feel like I'm trying to catch up. Right. Like I don't feel I'm in the pocket of it. Right. I'm just scared, probably. What stage direction do you dread seeing in a script? <laughs> um, stage direction. <laughs> She looks so glamorous. Right. <laughs> That's you know, just... anything where you have to show a sort of like glamour or prowess right. and something, you're just like, oh God, like I'd rather just be like, she walks in awkwardly. I'm like, no problem. That I can do. <laughs> that, got you. The most beautiful woman ever to walk the earth enters the room. Huh? Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, she's perfect in every way. <laughs> uh, I know this, I think dogs or cats. I mean, oh, do I know well, because I grew up with cats, so okay. I feel like I'm betraying my No, speak, cats. speak what you need to speak. Say it. No, I'm obsessed with my dog, so it has to be dogs. Correct yes. answer. Okay. Dog people. Woo. There's a couple of them. Uh, favorite adult beverage? Uh, margarita. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. Adult ha beverage. I think we know this. Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. It sounds like you. Harry are. Potter. Harry Potter. Okay. Harry Potter. They're rebooting it. We can get you in the new one. Are they? They're doing the TV series. It just came to me. Wait, new kids. It can be new kids. You could play the kid. You could play Hermione. <laughs> are there new books? No, no. They're gonna they're gonna do a more fully fleshed out series. Oh. Really get it to the nitty gritty. I love that you thought I could be Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> You can do anything you set your mind to. Sure, but not play an eight-year-old. Well, <laughs> John could be Hagrid. <laughs> he would be great. <laughs> uh, weirdest place you've ever been recognized? I was, uh, no, it's, it's not weird enough, probably. Thank you for the um, bar A high. porter porter potty. Hmm. You never want that, like, Wait, if you're coming. I was someone else in the port. Okay, got it. No, I you wasn't in there with right. someone. Okay, I'm just, uh, I just don't know. I didn't. No, I was on a hike, and then I stopped and had one, and ha had one. A, a pee, guys, a pee. <laughs> stopped and had one. Why would I even say that? <laughs> That's how you say it. That's like, eh, yeah, had one. Yeah. And so I had a pee, <laughs> and then I came out of the porta potty, and there was someone there, and yeah. they're like, oh my god. Huh. Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot that. Uh, that was you. I, yeah, I <laughs> well, <laughs> not that there's anything annoying about you, but what would your friends and family say? Say that's annoying? Yeah. Mm, I can be a little anal about being on time. Well, that's a good thing. No, it's not. It's, it's kind of annoying. Huh. It's kind of annoying. Like, I'll, I'll need to get to the airport early, you know, right. that kind of annoying. Well, this is a good quality. Well. Mm. How early? I mean, not like, I'm trying to think of something more annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you're perfect, we, we know it, we got it. No, uh, no, don't. That's uh, the script stuff I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I think you told me in a previous conversation that you were fascinated by what, what other people are scared of. Yeah. So what are you scared of? What's your, pho do you have a phobia? Cockroaches. Cockroaches, okay. Cockroaches, anything that moves too fast and furtively. 
I'm not disagreeing. I got, like, yeah. when we were in Australia shooting Fall Guy, <laughs> have you seen the spiders? Have you, like, they're like that. They're like that. They're not even one hand, they're two. They're two. <laughs> it was one of those massive ones, the Huntsman. The Huntsman spiders. I was sitting outside on the terrace and I suddenly looked in the house and I saw one just lurking on the wall. And I was like, John, you're up. You're up. I said, I will not do that. That is not my thing. Yeah. Seeing him try to bravely put a Tupperware over it was one of the best things I've ever seen. Because he walked up and he was trying to be brave. He went, OK, I'm just going to, you know what? Yeah, this is fine. I'm just going to, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to, here we go. OK, here we go. There we go. Oh my god. OK. <laughs> But talking himself up. Right. And then he slid the paper underneath, and it was very still, and he took it outside, and then he said he got very scared, because right before he released it, it just went brrr around the thing. <laughs> Even the sound he made describing it is just like brrr, like all around. So fast, so big, and so fast. So sneak peek so at a quiet place part three. I there know, you go. it's all <laughs> massive spiders and cockroaches. Um, we're wrapping up our wonderful time together. It's gone by quick. It's gone by quick. It's always a delight. Are you, look, I'm so happy for you, all the success Thank that is justifiable you. for this amazing performance of this amazing film. Are you superstitious? Are you gonna have a little speech somewhere just in case? No, 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 no. No? I don't think so. No, just gonna, because Emily Blunt winging it on a stage, that feels like the right thing to do. Well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said like inappropriate things all night here, but, um, well, regardless, you've won it's the all prize. It's all wonderful. Good. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, have a great end to this insane award season. But I mean, what a great ride. And, and, and congratulations to you and the entire group that Thank created this you. amazing piece We're of work. We're so happy. Thank you so much. Everybody, Thank give you. it up one more time. Emily Blunt, everybody. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>